In this tutorial, we're going to be looking at trigonometric functions, reciprocal trigonometric functions, and hyperbolic functions. And in particular, we're going to be looking at how to solve equations involving those classifications of function. Now, just before we start, we're going to look at some graphs, and we're going to do this in order to emphasize a couple of key points. Now, what we have on the screen here is the function sine x in the top left-hand corner, or you could also think of this as sine theta. Now, as we can see from this function, on the x-axis, we go from 0 to 360 degrees, and in doing so, we complete one full cycle of the function. Now, this would also be the case for cos x. A couple of other things we notice is that between 0 and 180 degrees, the function has a positive value, and between 180 and 360 degrees, the function has a negative value. It's a cyclic function. It would repeat from cycle to cycle. We also notice that when x or theta equals 0, the value of the function is 0. When x or theta equals 90 degrees, the value of the function is 1. When x or theta equals 180 degrees, the value of the function is 0, and so on, going to minus 1 at 270 degrees, and then back to 0 at 360 degrees. Now, the first thing to point out is that if we wanted to find the value of x or theta when the function equaled a half as an example, we can see by looking at the graph that there would actually be two solutions between 0 and 360 degrees. And again, if we wanted to find the value of x or theta when the function was, say, minus 0 0.7, so down here somewhere, again, we could see that there would be two solutions between 0 and 360 degrees. So what we'll be looking at when we solve these equations is how to determine those two values for a sine function and a cosine function. We're also going to extend that theory to our reciprocal sine and reciprocal cosine graphs. Now directly underneath the sine graph we have cosec x and cosec x is the reciprocal of sine x or said another way 1 over sine x. Now in order to produce that cosec graph, all we do is 1 over the values on the sine graph. And I'll give you some examples. When x equals 90 degrees, we're here on the sine x graph at a value of 1. Well, 1 divided by 1 is just 1. So we see the same on our cosec graph. The value is 1. Now, the reason why we end up with these asymptotes going off towards infinity here and here is because as we approach this end of our sine graph, so down here, we have values of sine x of approaching 0. So let's take an example. Let's say sine x was 0 0.1. Well, 1 divided by 0 0.1 is 10. When sine x is 0 0.1, the value of our cosec function is 10, so we would be up here somewhere off of our scale. And if our value of sine x was to become even smaller, say 0 0.001, then 1 over 0 0.001 is 1,000. So as we approach 0, we see that function go off towards infinity. Now the same is true over on the other end of our graph. So now we're looking at x between 135 and 185, we can see that the value of that function is approaching zero. It's still positive, but it's approaching zero. So our cosec graph, as before, will become 10 when our sine x graph is 0 0.1, and it will become 1,000 when our sine x graph is 0 0.001, and when it reaches zero, the value of that function would be infinity. We can repeat that for the negative segment of our graph. On the negative segment of sine x, when x equals 270 degrees, sine x equals minus 1. Well, 1 over minus 1 is minus 1, therefore the value on our cosec graph is also minus 1. However, when we look at the section between 225 degrees and 180 degrees on our sine x graph, so heading in this direction, we can see that the value of sine x is approaching minus 0. So what we would end up with, let's say for example, the value of sine x was minus 0 0.1, so perhaps here somewhere, and here somewhere on our y-axis, then we would have 1 divided by minus 0 0.1, 
which is minus 10. And that's why we see a negative asymptote here on our cosec x graph. And we could replicate that thinking between 315 degrees and 360 degrees on our cosec graph, because as the value of sine x approaches zero, noting that we have negative values of sine x approaching zero, cosec x is going to approach negative infinity here as well. Now, the important part of all of that is that what we notice, again, with our cosec graph, in the same as we did with our sine x graph, is that often we will have two solutions. So let's say, for example, we know that cosec x is 4. So I'm just going to circle 4 on my y-axis. Well, if cosec x equals 4, then once again we're going to have two solutions. We're going to have a solution here when x is between 0 and 45 degrees, but we're also going to have a solution here when x or theta is between 135 and 180 degrees. And we'll just do one more example. Let's say cosec x is minus 3. We have minus 3 here. When we track across, we can see that there's two solutions. There's a solution here between x equals 180 and x equals 225, and another solution here between 315 and 360. Now, the last thing that I wanted to emphasize on this video was that all of the graph transformations that we've seen previously also apply to our reciprocal sine and our reciprocal cosine functions, also known as cosec and sec. So if we look at the third graph here, what we notice is for the function 2.5 cosec x, all of our values of the function cosec x have been multiplied by 2.5, or the amplitude has been increased to 2.5. And the places where this is most obvious is at 90 degrees, where on our cosec function, 90 degrees cosec x or cosec theta was 1 and on our 2.5 cosec x graph we can see that it's now 2.5 and the same in our negative segment it goes from at 270 degrees or x equals 270 whichever you prefer the value of the cosec function was minus 1 and over here on the 2.5 cosec function it's now minus 2.5 and this will also be the case for translations and all of the other types of graph transformation that we'd seen previously. Now let's look at cos and sec just to reinforce some of these points. And the first thing to notice when we look at the graph in the top left hand corner for cos x is that we have a repeating function again. When x or theta equals 0, here on the left hand side the value of the function is 1. And when x or theta, whichever you prefer, is 90, the value of the function is 0. When x or theta is 180, the value of the function is minus 1. At 270, the value of the function is back to 0. And then at 360, it returns to 1. So it's a cyclic function. Some of the other points that we mentioned in the previous video is that if we calculate a solution for this graph, and let's say we're trying to find the value of x that makes cos x equal to a half, then what we can see is between the limits of 0 and 360 again, there's two solutions. There's a solution here, but there's also a solution here. And the same is true if we was trying to find the value of x or theta that made cos x equal to minus 0.5. Again, we could see that there would be two values of x or theta that made that true. Now underneath that we have the graph of sec x, which is the reciprocal of cos x. So sec x is 1 over cos x. And we could go through the process that we did previously in order to determine the shape of that graph. So when cos x equals 1, sec x equals 1 over 1. And 1 over 1 is 1. When cos x is, say, 0 0.1, sec x is 1 over 0 0.1, or 10. So we're going up here, again towards an asymptote. Because when cos x is 0 0.001, sec x is 1000. So we see these values of sec x increasing towards infinity, as we did previously. We then enter a negative segment, and if cos x is, 
say minus 0.1, so we're somewhere around here. Then sec x is 1 over minus 0.1 or minus 10. So here we have a negative asymptote. And again, if the value of cos x was minus 0.001, then the value of sec x would be 1 over that, which would be minus 1,000. So again, we see this asymptote. And I'm sure you could repeat that process for yourself in order to determine the asymptote at 270 degrees and also the value of the function sec x when cos x equals 1. We return back to 1 here. Now there's one last important thing to point out for these graphs and that is although we see a line on our function here and here, in reality those lines wouldn't exist on the graph because what we're doing is we're jumping from infinity positive just to the left of 90 degrees to infinity negative just to the right of 90 degrees. So we would jump from positive infinity to negative infinity and exactly the same at 270 degrees. We would jump from negative infinity to positive infinity either side of 270 degrees. So although when we produce the graph those lines are visible, they wouldn't actually appear on our graphs. And the reason I mention that is because, let's say for example, the value of sec x, the graph in the bottom left hand corner, is minus 3, then we only have two solutions. We have a solution here between 90 and 135 degrees, and we have a solution here between 225 and 270 degrees. The values of 90 and 270 wouldn't constitute a solution because these lines in theory aren't actually visible. Now finally, just to note on the graph in the top right hand corner, as we said before, our graph transformations still apply. So we see a graph there that's sec x plus 10 degrees, all plus 2. Well the plus 2 means that our graph has been translated in the y-axis by plus 2. And this phase angle of plus 10 degrees here means that our whole graph has been shifted in the x-direction by minus 10. Now if you're unsure about those graph transformations, you can go back and watch the tutorial in the bridging courses, but we'll also be talking about this in a little bit more depth in order to understand what's happening with these graphs and why we end up with two solutions. We will also use these facts to determine the two solutions, say when sec x plus 10 degrees or plus 2 equals minus 4. We know that there will be two solutions, there'll be a solution here and a solution here but we need to take account of the fact that the graph has been translated in our x-axis.